Ladies and Ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, we would encourage everyone to move down closer to the front for our afternoon sessions, please, and also towards the middle of the lecture hall. Rows one and two are still reserved, but everything else is available. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and get, get our afternoon session underway. Um, so we are going to um, continue focusing on, on this, what I consider a very primary question of how do we keep guns from dangerous people? And so uh, our next speaker um, is Dr. Garen Wintemute who, uh, of course, gave that fantastic presentation just before lunch, and, and he's going to pick it back up with a very interesting study that, that he's done um, looking at many, many, many gun shows. So it's all yours, Karen. Welcome back. Um, I will tell you this, uh, the lunch you just had is a long way better than the food you get at a gun show. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my topic. Um, and I will, I will say this, that in consideration of comprehensive background checks, what gun shows can tell us is what private party sales look like. Uh, this is going to be, it's the postprandial lecture. This is the lecture with no data. I believe there are three numbers and one decimal point in this talk. Um, so, yeah. They, they actually, uh, they, they, in the original agenda, this was the lunch talk. What I'm giving, And the, the very data intensive thing that I gave a minute ago was the talk immediately after lunch. Uh, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> so, but I do want to start with, with this. Um, uh, we've all of us have emphasized uh, a percentage that, that we're trying to, I think, probably drill in, although there's been no conversation. And that is for you all to keep in mind that something like 60% of people who commit serious violent crime in the United States under current federal law are not prohibited from acquiring firearms at the time they commit those crimes. Second percentage is 40%. The 40% that we all use to talk about the percentage of transactions involving firearms that, that are private sales. That, <clears throat> excuse me, we have two national surveys actually, one everybody knows about and one uh, not so much. Um, but they both uh, come down on, on basically that same point, that approximately 60, approximately 40% of all firearms transfers in the United States um, involve private sales. But a percentage that has been alluded to, and I wanna just hammer it home, um, before I move on, is that for the transactions we're most interested in, that percentage is not too high, as some people have kind of wondered. It's too low. It's too low by half. If you ask those same incarcerated felons committed a fine, blah, 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 where'd you get your gun? 80% of those criminal transactions occur uh, in the secondary market, our private, our private party transfers. So I have been writing for years about 40% of blah, blah, blah. That sentence is going to now be 40% of all transfers and 80% of those apparently made with criminal intent, et cetera. So having said that, gun shows. Why go to a gun show? Um, I have talked to people uh, about gun shows and described them as something just remotely akin to zoos. Not that way. Um, it's this. If you want to see a wide array of animal behavior up close, concentrated, and easily observable, you go to a zoo. If you want to see the entire panoply of firearm commerce, at least at the retail level, right out there where you can see it, go to a gun show. Gun shows um, are where this stuff, not where it all happens, um, they're where um, it can all be seen. 
Um, as, as Daniel mentioned, we did a study uh, involving direct observational data and some worn out pairs of shoes and some pictures. You're gonna see some at not quite 80 gun shows around the country. This is the book length report of that study. It's available on our web for free, website for free. If we're gonna go to gun shows, we need a map. Here's a map of a gun show. I know what, I'll use the cursor for a pointer. <laughs> some gun shows are held indoors and some out, but basically they're all the same. They have a perimeter. Um, there are people walking around. Some of the people walking around represented by these black dots are carrying firearms. And in most cases, uh, they are carrying those firearms and offering them for sale. And you'll see that in just a second. Other people um, are not carrying firearms for sale and may or may not be interested in buying. Somewhere just right inside the entrance is uh, oftentimes where this uh, most informal buying and selling congregates, as, as you'll see in just a moment. And then within the gun show um, are people, vendors of various types, who rent table space in order to um, offer their wares for sale. And here in the, um, yeah, it still looks kind of orange, um, orange squares would be a federally licensed retailer, somebody who's a gun store and a truck, and they, and they set up shop. Um, typically smaller in scale represented by these green um, uh, tables or squares, but not always um, smaller to tell you the truth, are the private party people, the people who say I'm not in the business, I'm just augmenting my collection, Enhan enhancing is the verb. Um, and then um, there are people who sell other things, ammunition, clothing, food. If you like jerky, you're in, for, you're in uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's take a look. So this is the entrance. Um, this is, um, I, I think probably, or was, the largest open air market for um, the free trade of firearms in the world, at least in the, the Western Hemisphere. Um, we are just inside the entrance to the Arizona State Fairgrounds, um, which holds some wild, wild and woolly events indeed. The pictures like this are now becoming fairly well known, so I'm gonna move through them, I think, fairly quickly. But here we see a bunch of guys just lined up these white squares are the pieces of paper on which they have written what they've got for sale. Uh, this guy's got a rifle. Uh, these guys, I believe, have handguns. We'll see more of it. Here's a guy uh, with an AR for sale. Here's another guy with something for sale who's examining yet a third party's wares. The buying and selling is uh, just a free exchange. We're still in, in Phoenix, I believe, actually that same day. ARs are very popular. We've all read about them. They seem to me this is just a guy walking around with a camera. They seem to be particularly uh, popular in this least regulated of markets. There are no data. Um, but here's a guy who's, who's interested in buying. Here's a fellow who's uh, a spectator to that who's also selling an M1, a, a, um, a mil an older uh, military design. This spectator over here is also selling a rifle of his own. Um, and here, with a little bit more detail, same show, different month. It's held every two or three months. Um, the seller is the gentleman on the left, and he's selling an FAL type. It's a, it's a European design of uh, semi-automatic uh, or full auto, but that's not what this is, um, rifle. And his sign tells you that it's available for $750, and there's some more information about some accessories and whatnot. And the fellow over here... <clears throat> is considering buying, and in the end, he doesn't buy this particular weapon. In this particular spot inside the Arizona State Fairgrounds, you can stand in place. The first set of photos, pretty much, and many more, were taken standing in one place on a single day and just turning in circle and taking the pictures. It's just happening all um, around you. Sometimes it's a little bit more organized. If, I, if I'm selling and I've got inventory, guns are heavy, I may need some help. Um, the gentleman on the left, this photograph is from Tampa, has a sandwich board advertising a rifle and some handguns. One of the rifles is crossed out. It's been sold already. The two gentlemen opposite here um, are looking at the identical text that's on the other side of, of the sandwich board. Uh, at a show in Ohio, I saw a guy similarly outfitted who had porters, people to carry his inventory for him as he bought and sold. Um, this gentleman here has um, one, one of, actually it's not all that uncommon, improvised vehicle, he's got a baby stroller with a couple of spring clamps up here, and he's got rifles down into, with the barrels protected by these um, soft drink coolers. 
And as I wa this was in uh, Dallas, and as I walked up, I thought, boy, all, all that uh, conveyance and not a whole lot of inventory, it had just been a good day. He had sold down to that one rifle, and within 30 seconds of taking this picture, uh, his, his wife, I will assume, uh, a woman he knew well, came up from behind me toward him, had a baby carriage with a baby in it and a whole bunch of handguns in a box, and she was sort of mid-gun mid show restocking the portable store, and, and uh, off he went to continue to sell. Not all the private sellers are wandering around. As I mentioned, some of them rent table space. I'm going to show you some examples. This gentleman is also in Phoenix, it being Phoenix. The private sale sign is bilingual. Um, he is selling an array of firearms, conventional semi-autos. There's an AR. I want to call your attention to these concealable ARs. These are not post-market modifications. These are manufactured firearms. They are legal. And um, more recent designs have uh, taken this recoil spring. You don't need to know what it is. You just need to know that it sticks out and makes the gun longer. And they've put it up here on top of the uh, upper body of the receiver. The modern um, concealable AR uh, is about this long. I, I have video of a guy showing how you carry it concealed to his, to his friends. Um, and the next time the uh, slide comes up, the poster for the conference, notice that you've been looking at a concealable AK with a 30 round mag all day. Those things are about like this. They fire the same ammunition. They have the same working parts that the rifle does. They're just concealable, and they're legal. Another transaction that actually, in this case, did not uh, go through to fruition, the Duke looks on as a couple of uh, young men uh, negotiate the possible purchase of a firearm from an FFL, from a licensed retailer. But they're, they're specifically looking at these two ARs down here at the bottom, uh, which, apart from the regular inventory of the retailer, are being offered at private sale for $2,600. Lord only knows what the price of those rifles would be uh, today. It's probably doubled. Um, it is legal for an FFL to be simultaneously and in the same place operating as a licensed retailer and as a private party. I want to preface this, uh, this the, my talk about this slide with this statement. I, I really believe this to be true. I, I think it is true that the great majority of private parties who sell firearms through this legal process, as I think is true of the great majority of licensed retailers, have no interest whatsoever in furnishing firearms for criminal purposes. I really believe that. Um, I'm not making that up. But it's, it's equally clear to me that there are some who don't care. There are some who actively solicitate criminal business. I know whereof I speak about this. Um, this gentleman, um, I, this is one of those times that you just don't quite get the camera ready. So this is a picture from earlier in the day, and this is a picture very slightly later. <clears throat> These four men uh, have been cruising the gun show in Phoenix, buying from everybody they could buy from. They were almost out of money. Um, and they approached the retailer in the upper left, I'm sorry, excuse me, they approached the private party, the seller, um, in the upper left, and they negotiated the purchase price of a semi-auto. No one among them uh, had enough money to make the purchase, but they, they did when they pooled their cash. So this gentleman, uh, and, and they were partly encumbered as they were pooling uh, by the guns and the magazines that they had already acquired that day. This vendor sold that gun to the group of them, no waiting period, no background check, blah, blah, blah. Um, and as they walked out, the four of them with six handguns uh, and as many magazines as they could carry, as they're walking out and I'm, and I'm following them, between me and them step two Phoenix gang officers in tactical gear, following these two gentlemen out, shaking their heads, saying they're just going to take them out on the street and sell them. Um, and I have learned that the modern equivalent of running out of film at a critical moment is having your memory chip fill up at a critical moment. So I don't have those pictures. Um, we did a formal comparative study. We uh, looked at shows in California, which regulates private party sales, as I've described, which also separately regulates gun shows, um, puts undercover cops in gun shows, and everybody knows it. They're really boring from my perspective. Um, and we compared shows in California to shows in four states that um, have none of those regulations. Two of them are next door, and all four of them are very important sources of guns. They are the four leading sources, other than California itself, of guns used in crime in California. And you've already seen the conclusions. Basically, the shows differed 
uh, in that the things that you're not allowed to do in California didn't happen in California, but you're allowed to do those things in other places, private party sales, rapid fire, rapid sequence purchasing, and so on. Um, and those things happen all the time. There was one finding that I, had not occurred to me to expect uh, that emerged um, from the observational work. And that was something that, that I don't mean this geographically, we might call the diffusion of benefit. Um, on a per hour of observation, I was the observer, on a per hour of observation time, I towed it up, how frequently did I observe straw purchases by state and so on. Straw purchases, which um, Mayor Bloomberg accurately described, I, he might be the only living mayor who can accurately describe a straw purchase. Um, that man deserves all the praise you give him. Um, uh, very illegal everywhere under federal law, um, but they were much more common in states uh, that uh, don't do much at gun shows than in the state that does. Now, this study and some other work generated some publicity, and I, I heard that that free mark, that open air market that um, I have shown you pictures of had basically closed, that the promoter was saying you can't sell guns there. So I went back, and um, this time I'm shooting video, and these are stills from video, so they're not as clear. But indeed, in that area, there are these barriers with absolutely no gun sales in this area signs, but everybody is congregated about 150 feet away up against a building. All they did was relocate about a 30-second walk. Um, have not been back there since. Um, but the other thing that happened was this, and Janie was kind enough to mention, um, as our project was sort of maturing and, and winding down, uh, the office of the mayor of the city of New York sent a team of private detectives out, and we talked cameras, and we talked how to try and avoid detection, um, and talked about some gun shows they might want to go to. Um, I'm one guy walking around with a camera. These people were pros. Um, and I had some rules of engagement that said, you can't talk to anybody, but they were not so hampered, and they shot video, and I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to let this uh, speak for itself. You're not one of those licensed guys, right? I just have to see your ID and you have to be a resident. So no background checks, right? No. Good, because I probably couldn't pass one. So why would you do that? Have you been bad? Have I been bad? Uh, I'd rather not go there. You take, uh, what do you say, four? Four eighty, cash money. No background checks. <laughs> no tax, no charges, nothing, just 500 and it's yours. Because, I'll where you go. Because I couldn't pass one. How much is it? Five. Okay. You sure no background check? No, well, I don't think I can pass one. Tag, get it out the door and it's yours. <laughs> okay. Because we're not a dealer, this is private party sales. It just happens to be an Ohio resident. Right. Well, good, because I probably couldn't pass one. So I don't think I could either. That's good about background check, because I probably couldn't pass one. I don't care. Huh? All I got to do is demand you show me your license. Okay. So you don't care about the background check, no. right? Nope. All right. Because I wouldn't pass either, but So no background check, right? Yeah, that's right. All right, good, because I probably couldn't pass one. <laughs> okay, so no background check. Nope. All right, good. I probably couldn't pass one. <laughs> one of those things, you I know? hear you, yeah. All right, let's do it. No background check, because I probably... Get the idea? Now, what they did was... Can you get my PowerPoint back? Thanks. Um, they did some pre-screening. This was a random, random selection. They um, identified retailers that they thought <coughs> uh, were engaged in the business. So they selectively targeted retailers, um, which is important to mention because two-thirds of the retailers they targeted failed what they, what they call an integrity test. But it's a highly selected uh, population. So much for a focus on gun shows. I'd like to take a step back and remind us of all the following things. Gun proportions, gun shows account for a small proportion of all sales. Take my word for it. I'm, uh, I've been getting the, uh, the high sign about time and I'm just gonna motor on. 
Um, most sales at gun shows are made by licensed retailers. We have survey data from more than one study to support this. And that simply doing the math means that private party sales at gun shows have to be a smaller proportion yet uh, of all gun sales in the United States. And we also know from ATF trafficking investigations that licensed retailers are the primary source of crime-involved guns from gun shows. So what does that mean? It means this. Um, I would like to declare that today, I, I'm gonna just do it and go home and feel good about it. To, today is the day we stop talking about closing the gun show loophole as the solution to regulating private party sales. Closing the gun show loophole will not take care of private party sales because most of them occur elsewhere. Closing the gun show loophole won't even take care of the problem associated with gun shows because most of the bad stuff associated with gun shows involves licensed retailers and not private parties. And I'm gonna to stick to my time and give you one last thing real quickly. I mentioned earlier uh, that um, I sometimes uh, draw an analogy between gun shows and um, zoos. It occurred to me in getting ready for this talk and doing some background work that it may be uh, starting to be time for me to draw an analogy between gun shows and museums. I, I, I am new to this. I'm just gonna show you an example. I, I didn't see it being covered elsewhere. Um, I wanna talk for just a second about guns, gun selling on the internet. January 3rd at about 7.30 in the morning in my own apartment in, with my uh, cup of coffee brewing, I went shopping for guns. I went to Arms List, <clears throat> which is one of several um, sites where one can buy firearms on the internet. I was in California, but I was coming here, so I decided I'm gonna shop for guns in Maryland. So I clicked and got the listing of all kinds of guns in Maryland. But I, I'm selective, a selective shopper, so I decided that I would shop for handguns in Maryland. And that got me a long listing of handguns in Maryland. But um, maybe I'm a prohibited person. Uh, maybe I'm buying a gun with criminal intent and I don't want a paper trail. Maybe I just am a privacy guy, but I'm gonna selectively choose private party sellers. I can do at arms list. Um, and here's the list of handguns available from private party sellers in, um, in Maryland. Down at the bottom, I see something that strikes my interest and I click on it. And up comes a fairly long description of a Scorpion semi-automatic handgun. If I scroll down some, there's a picture down at the bottom of the scroll uh, on this same page. The uh, price is highlighted for me, it's $600. It reminds me that this is a private party sale and there's the convenient contact seller button. If I scroll down a little bit further, I see another picture of the gun, another uh, concept, contact the seller button, I, I, and I'm not gonna go into, um, when I click on it, I'll, I'll go this far, um, I see the message thing where I can send an email um, and it gives me some terms of use and, and so forth. I wanna come back to this gun. Um, this particular gun is a 32 caliber. It's a small caliber gun. It's um, sort of scary looking, but if I were a serious bad guy, I would have no interest in this gun. But it proves the point. I could meet this guy any place. His house, my house, McDonald's. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to know. Why go to a gun show if I can do this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm gonna be giving the next presentation where um, I'm gonna be talking, again, the general theme is uh, keeping guns from criminals, uh, the role of universal background checks and other forms of firearm seller accountability. Uh, notice my terminology here, firearm seller accountability. Um, I kinda of like the ring of that, people, talk about gun control, gun restrictions, whatever. To me, uh, what we lack in this country is any form of accountability in our firearms laws. And I, I think that's sort of the direction we should be headed uh, in our thinking uh, going forward. Uh, I had several co-authors for this talk, uh, Jan Vernick, Beth McGinty, Kate Biddies, and Ted Alcorn. <clears throat> I wanna start with some weaknesses that we've been talking about. Um, in the current federal law, of course, we, the private show um, uh, loophole, not private show, private seller loophole, pardon me. Um, 
Other weaknesses, however, we've talked less about is that we have a lot of laws that protect licensed gun dealers from uh, inspections, from license revocations, prosecutions, lawsuits, and even general embarrassment by hiding the data about the number of guns connected to, uh, to different uh, gun dealers. And there's an enormous disparity uh, across gun dealers. Some gun dealers um, sell far, far, far more guns that end up in the hands of criminals than do other, um, than other licensed dealers. Uh, we also have no system of licensing and registration for uh, gun owners. And importantly, and, and this is something that I, I don't think gets talked about much, is even a requirement to uh, report it if your gun has been stolen or lost. The reason that's relevant, and again, it sort of gets to this general notion of accountability. If you're, the gun that you purchased subsequently is recovered from a criminal, uh, if you can simply say, oh, uh, let's see, I, I guess that must, I must have lost her, that, that, that gun must have been stolen. Um, people who actually do the investigations um, find it very helpful when they have something that they can charge people with that they at least didn't go through the procedures to um, report their gun as being stolen. Uh, Garen alluded to this in his talk about how criminals get guns. These data come from um, a survey of state um, in, inmates in state prisons who have uh, committed, um, the reason they're in jail is because they committed a gun with a handgun. And uh, roughly, as Garen said, roughly 80% uh, obtained their firearm through a, a transaction that in all likelihood was not regulated. There was no requirement for a background check system. Um, the last two columns in the table um, look at those who were and were not legally prohibited when they, they made their um, acquisition of the handgun. And what I find particularly interesting, and again, I think uh, often isn't discussed or, or considered, is that even those who are not prohibited, uh, the vast majority find it uh, advantageous to acquire their handguns in some uh, transaction that would not be documented. So in addition to, to thinking about the idea of, of accountability in, in our systems, is not only to identify those who are prohibited from being able to access a gun, but it's also a measure of accountability. If a gun is, turns up in crime, that, that if you can connect that to an individual, I think that individual will be uh, more careful about whether he, he uses a gun in crime or, or transfers it to someone who might, uh, who might use it in, in crime. Um, so there are linkages between the, the more formal and regulated market that we, we think about uh, with licensed dealers. We know from um, investigation, actually, that Anthony Braga uh, did for the um, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms years ago, that um, licensed gun dealers are a very important channel of guns being diverted into the licit market. Uh, and it's a relatively small proportion of dealers, depending on how you cut the data, one to five percent um, of gun dealers account for the majority of guns recovered in crime. And as wor some work that Garen Wintemute has done, we know that uh, that enormous dis discrepancy across gun dealers and, and variability of, of the rate at which their guns are recovered in crime cannot simply be explained away uh, by some gun dealers selling more guns or the demographics of the, their uh, clientele or even local crime rates. So to me, it suggests that there simply are differences in their sales practices that make some dealers targets for, um, I think Garen coined the term, bad guy magnets. Um, we also know from some research that we've done, and I think Garen, uh, excuse me, Jan, uh, we'll cover this a little bit in his talk next, is that undercover stings of gun dealers that have a lot of um, traces to crime, uh, they find blatantly illegal sales from those dealers. So we know our federal system lacks a lot in, in terms of accountability. Thankfully, we at least have some states that do go further in trying to have a system of accountability. They do have universal background checks, permit to purchase licensing. This is when, rather than simply go to your friendly gun dealer and fill out a form and say, I'll take one of these and two of these, 
uh, you actually go, go to a law enforcement agency where you're photographed, fingerprinted, and if you think about the, the situation of a straw purchaser, probably far, eas uh, far easier to recruit someone to make an illegal sale if you don't have to first go to a law enforcement agency to get a permit. Um, there are also firearm registries that, we've, that have been alluded to earlier, mandatory theft and loss reporting. Um, while they're, they're, uh, the federal government licenses firearms dealers, some states also uh, require their own licensing and regulations, which is important because, as I alluded to before, the federal laws um, really are, are written to the advantage of the, of the dealers uh, to reduce accountability. Um, also, an anti-trafficking um, policy is this the notion of one gun per person per month to prevent bulk sales that traffickers might prefer. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll mention is it's important to remember when you look at state laws that um, in the majority of cases, they only are placing these additional accountability measures on handguns. And, and, and for long guns, it's, it's a far even less regulated environment. I'm going to take you uh, uh, quickly through a few studies that we've done that, that I think show some very consistent patterns here with firearm seller accountab accountability measures and the diversion of guns to criminals. The first one we published in the Journal of Urban Health 2009. It was a study where we took ATF crime gun trace data from 54 cities that had done comprehensive trace practices um, had, had been in place in those cities. We looked at the uh, state gun laws, but in addition to that, we actually did a survey of state and local law enforcement agencies to see whether what practices they engaged in with respect to the oversight of licensed gun dealers. And we did some regression analysis where we controlled for a, a number of factors, including other state gun laws, uh, gun ownership proxies, and the proximity to other states with weak gun laws. What we found was um, when you just looked at their, the state having strong gun dealer regulations by itself, it actually did not um, affect the diversion of guns to criminals. It was only having those laws in concert with a practice of, in those agencies of, of regular audit inspections and oversight of those dealers, which I think is quite interesting and important. Um, we also found that uh, states that regulated prior, private firearm sales, these are actually almost always just regulating handgun sales, 48% uh, lower level of diversion of guns to criminals in, um, associated with that policy. Um, places that had a permit to purchase uh, system of licensing that also offered law enforcement some degree of discretion uh, that they could um, deny a particular application, even if someone met the criteria, if they had other reason to believe that they represented a risk. 64% um, lower rate of diversion of criminals in the, such um, associated with those policies. So these are cro this is a, that was a cross-sectional look at this, of sort of comparing state to state. Uh, what's a little more convincing and if you think about causal attribution is looking at change over time. Now, in many of these, the state laws in question, there hasn't been a lot of change in recent years where we've had better data from, from trace data. An exception, however, is Missouri recently dropped, uh, repealed its law for permit to purchase uh, licensing of, of handgun owners on August 28th of 2007. They did away with their permit to purchase system and included in that, um, they did away with um, background checks and, and, and record keeping for private sales as well. So, um, so after the law was repealed, you could make the kind of transactions that Garen was showing us at the gun show or in, or in other places. But also importantly, even the transactions with licensed gun dealers were different because again, uh, you no longer had to go to a law enforcement agency to get that permit. So what we did is we looked at a common indicator of diversion of guns to criminals, this idea of a very short interval between a retail sale and recovery in crime, and looked at it particularly uh, as it related to when the 
um, change in, in the sales practices, or excuse me, the sales policies occurred. We also looked at the change in the ratio of out-of-state guns to in-state guns, where the guns are coming from. States with stricter laws, like a permit to purchase system, tend to have a higher sh share of guns coming from outside of the state because there's a relative scarcity of such guns when you have tighter, more comprehensive regulations. This is the hardest graph I'll show you, so I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, these are all very short intervals between a retail sale and recovery and crime. The yellow bar is uh, only up to three months interval, uh, less than three months between sale and recovery from a criminal or crime scene. The red bar is three to 12 months, and then the sort of aqua blue is one to two years. Now recall that uh, the policy uh, was repealed in um, late August of 2007. So what you should start to see is a change in, in if the policy caused more diversions of guns to criminals, you should start to see a change in that yellow bar beginning in 2007 that then goes up dramatically after that. And that's precisely what you see in this graph. You should also see that those three to 12 months uh, guns, time to crime guns, should begin to go up around 2008. And guess what? That's precisely what they do. They shoot up quite dramatically uh, beginning in 2008 and stay uh, at a much higher level after that. The one to two year guns, again, if they're connected to this change in sales policy, you should start to see increasing in 2009. Guess what? That's precisely what you see in the graph. So we see very clearly, and if you just sort of total this up, you have a more, more than a two-fold increase in these very short um, sale-to-crime kind of interval guns that suggest diversion of guns to criminals uh, as, a, as a response to the change in sales practice. Sorry, went in the wrong direction. Um, so we don't, that's no comparison group. Maybe that's just some national trend and phenomenon. Well, absolutely, it's actually the opposite. Uh, the average interval between sale to crime in, in the red gr graph here represented the, the national average has actually been increasing at the same time that the uh, time to crime has been decreasing in Missouri. And you see that that deceleration uh, uh, in time to crime um, accelerating after the policy went into, pl into place. This graph is the ratio is, is uh, in state to out of state guns. The yellow graph is guns that have been sold uh, by dealers in Missouri. The red from everywhere else. And as predicted, if the law is going to contribute to more guns being diverted, you should see precisely that fork in the road that you see. Uh, no longer uh, are guns needed from out of state because the current state policy is making it quite convenient for criminals and traffickers to be able to get the guns directly uh, at home in Missouri. So finally, uh, I'll share with you the, 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 some data looking at all, all the things that we've, I've shown you thus far were sort of internal, what happens uh, in, inside a state. What about, we, we've talked also about guns traveling across state borders. So we looked at the current state um, at state gun policies and firearm accountability measures, um, and whether they're related to how many guns a state exports to other states. Again, this was a cross-sectional design. We used data from 2009 from data that are posted on the ATF's website. Uh, and we created a measure of number of exported crime guns uh, to criminals per population, a per capita export rate. We controlled uh, not only for the set of state gun laws, but also levels of gun ownership, um, border population in states with stronger laws that might attract guns coming across the border, as well as bordering Canada and Mexico. Also, uh, how much out migration, because maybe gun owners moving from state A to state B simply take their guns with them. Um, and so we, we control for that. So if you just look at the raw data in export rates, you see, uh, enormous disparities, this just looking at the, the highest, um, the states with the highest rates of exporting, Mississippi, West Virginia, Kentucky, Alabama, and South Carolina. 
Um, when I first looked at this, I was thinking this has to have something to do with being in the Southeastern Athletic Conference, uh, NCAA. <laughs> that was my hypothesis. I'm not sure. Um, uh, alternatively, you see uh, California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New, J New York, uh, a fraction of that, uh, of the rate at which they're exporting guns used in crime. Um, so when you do the regression analysis to see which of these laws are most important, you find the most powerful um, deterrent to exporting crime guns is having uh, this discretionary permit to purchase system. But even having a non-discretionary permitting process where you actually have to show up at a law enforcement agency reduced um, export rates by 55%, uh, statistically significant. And importantly for the policies that we're talking about now being considered is that private sales regulations reduce diversion across state lines by 30%. And uh, by a similar uh, magnitude, mandatory theft and loss reporting laws also decrease ex, um, exporting of crime guns. Something we haven't talked about is uh, bans of what some people would call junk guns. These are very inexpensive, poorly made handguns that are, Garen Wintermute has shown, is overrepresented in crime. Uh, those laws, because presumably uh, you can buy a lot of cheap guns with not a lot of investment, and in, if you take it to the right state, you can actually get a markup maybe four to five times higher from what you've purchased those guns um, with. Um, so uh, there were some laws that, that were unrelated. Um, they're, they're listed here, uh, non-discretionary permit to purchase, strong gun dealer regulation. We did not have the measure of actual enforcement here, so that may matter. Um, one gun a month that was uh, hypothesized to be important for interstate trafficking, we found, um, although the point estimate was uh, suggested a 19% reduction, uh, it was not statistically significant. Uh, I, I wanted to, to end with a, a little bit of data looking at the guns that were recovered in Mexico and look at the set of laws for the, the states bordering Mexico. So you, these are the four states that border Mexico, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And the, the last three that I mentioned have basically none of the laws of, of interest, as, but I'm sorry, I went too fast there. Uh, however, California, uh, does license gun dealers and allow inspections. They have penalties for not conducting background checks. They uh, do regulate private transactions uh, with handguns and um, uh, ban assault weapons, which of course are very important with respect to the Mexican uh, cartels and also have one gun per customer per month. So what is the, what is it, the exporting to Mexico look like? Uh, sort of as you might expect, uh, California uh, does not export nearly that many guns per capita as do Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. So briefly, limitations of these studies, uh, except for the Missouri study, most were cross-sectional kinds of uh, comparisons. Um, in some cases, we did not have the individual le level trace data that I would really love to have, but uh, are hard to come by because of the TR restrictions. Um, and the, I guess the most important thing is the uncertain relationship between whether reducing diversions um, will actually lead to reductions in gun violence. I've got to think personally that uh, if you have fewer guns going to criminals, that ultimately you'll be able to have lower rates of gun violence. Uh, so I think that as far as the policy implications, permit the person's licensing and universal background checks, clearly in, in study after study uh, seem to divert, uh, excuse me, reduce diversion of guns to criminals. Uh, less talked about but also important are theft and loss reporting and junk gun bans as well. Um, dealer regulation I think is key and at least some of our findings um, indicate that, that, that uh, doing a better job with regulation and oversight would greatly reduce diversion. So that's actually a good segue to our next talk. 
uh, Jan Vernick is going to talk to us uh, about policies relevant to uh, curtailing um, risky practices of, of gun dealers. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm Jan Vernick. I'm co-director of the Center for Gun Policy and Research here at Hopkins. And as Daniel said, I'll be talking about uh, curtailing dangerous sales practices of licensed gun dealers. And Daniel is uh, my co-author on this. Um, you know, it, it may be a surprising sort of truism that, that, that people don't, don't think clearly about always. That, that nearly all crime guns in the United States, nearly all guns that ultimately get used in crime, were first sold by a licensed gun dealer. Does that mean that all gun dealers are bad? Absolutely not. <coughs> I, <coughs> excuse me. I agree with, uh, with Garen Wintemute that, that actually most gun dealers are, are not. There's, there's evidence that Anthony Braga and others um, have generated that about 1% of the licensed gun dealers in the United States are responsible for more than half of the guns traced to crime. And as Daniel said, um, Garen has shown that that's not explained solely by uh, sales volume or locations. When I, when I state that statistic to my students or, or to others, I usually say, you know, that, that sounds like it would be bad news. There's, there's a small number of bad apple gun dealers out there that are supplying a lot of guns to criminals. But actually, we might think of it as sort of, as sort of good news. It means that if we can focus enforcement efforts on a relatively small number of dealers, we might have the opportunity for very substantial payout. Now, the flip side of that is that in studies done by Susan Sorensen and Kate Vitties and also by Garen as well, um, more broadly, if you survey gun dealers and you ask them, are you willing to make a sale under conditions that might seem questionable, like that sound like a straw purchase, anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of them um, are willing to say, to say yes. And Anthony Braga has also taught us that um, in ATF trafficking investigations, the largest single source of, um, of trafficking is, is gun dealers. So as folks have said, um, if you're in the business of selling guns in the United States, you have to have, um, you have to have a, a license from the federal government and FFL, a federal firearms license. There are about 55,000 federally licensed gun dealers in the, in the US, some states, uh, as Daniel mentioned, also require a state license. How, how, ma how many states in the U.S. require that the person who cuts your hair is, li uh, is licensed? Uh, and and in, an increasingly, I'll admit, irrelevant form of licensing for me. <laughs> but um, how, how, how many states require a cosmetologist to be licensed? The answer is all of them, all 50. How, how many states require a gun dealer license, the answer is 17. 17 states and the District of Columbia. And you can see them distributed here. And wide swaths of the country and the center in white have, have no licensing requirement. Well, why should you care if, if um, states license gun dealers if there is a federal license? Well, the existence of a state license gives local law enforcement, gives state law enforcement some leverage that they can apply to gun dealers. If states are able to inspect those gun dealers and identify problems, they can pull the state license without having to wait for the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to, to do something about it. And in, fact, and in fact, unfortunately, at the federal level, those inspections are severely limited. A law enacted in 1986 called the Federal Firearm Owners Protection Act limits the ATF to what, just one routine inspection of gun dealers per year. Most dealers are in fact inspected much less often in part because ATF doesn't have uh, the funds allocated to it to engage in more frequent inspection. One estimate some years ago was that uh, the average gun dealer could be expected or could expect to be inspected once every 17 years. So um, 
So not a, a great deal of risk if you're a gun dealer and you're selling guns off the books or out the back door. Um, just two states, two of those 17 states, the licensed gun dealers, actually mandate regular inspections of dealers. Other states do permit inspections, but only two, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, as you see here, actually mandate inspections. And as Daniel mentioned, research that, that he and I and other colleagues have done suggests that actually states that do license dealers that have other kinds of strong dealer oversight laws like record keeping laws and which in fact do conduct regular inspections are much less likely to be associated with intrastate trafficking, trafficking um, within, within the state. So, um, so inspection, licensing at the state level can actually make a big, a big difference. Well, that's intrastate trafficking. How about interstate trafficking? Well, research by uh, Mayors Against Illegal Guns um, that just takes a, a simple sort of cut at this says um, if, if states have dealer licensing and just permit inspection, their rate of exporting crime guns to other states is half that of states that don't have these kinds of laws. And again, this, this points out um, a problem that you'll hear about over and over that Mayor Bloomberg uh, highlighted in his morning presentation, which is that um, as good as the laws of some states are or can be, they're dramatically affected by the weaker laws around them, the, the laws of the other states that are exporting crime guns into them. And uh, you'll recall, again, Mayor Bloomberg was uh, saying that 85% of New York City's crime guns come from out of state, which again is why this summit focuses largely on what we can do at the federal level, federal policy. That doesn't mean that state policy isn't important, it is, but, uh, but federal policy um, that applies to all states can make an enormous difference. Okay, so what, what can you do about some of these um, some of these bad apple gun dealers. Well, as Daniel alluded to, um, we did some research that looked at what a handful of cities tried to do, Chicago uh, and Detroit and Gary, Indiana, in the late 1990s. They conducted st undercover stings of gun dealers that they had identified as largely supplying the crime guns to, um, to those cities. When they caught some of those gun dealers um, making illegal sales, and you can see the police in conducting those undercover stings. They posed as gang members to make illegal straw sales. They blatantly hinted that they were looking to settle a score or that they were buying the gun for, uh, for their boyfriend if it was a, a female. Um, so uh, having identified those folks, uh, Chicago in particular, um, indicted them, uh, brought lawsuits against the dealers, distributors, um, and, uh, and manufacturers. There were also stings and lawsuits in, um, in Detroit, but the intervention was a little bit less, um, less robust there. So, um, so what we find, um, basically um, the, the flow of new guns to criminals following these stings, lawsuits, and enforcement practices was, um, was very much lower in Chicago and Detroit, whether you looked just at in-state licensees or, or all licensees. It was clearly sending a message to these dealers that it's not business as usual, that your risk is increased if you're going to engage in, on, in dangerous, unlawful practices. Um, and we saw no change in comparison cities, also in the Midwest, Cincinnati, Cleveland, St. Louis, that didn't engage in these kinds of stings. So it's not merely some, some secular trend that was, that was happening over time. Well, I mentioned that, that one of the important tools associated with these undercover stings was not just not just bringing, um, bringing uh, criminal cases or doing the sting, but also suing them. You know, these are, these are businesses and they are very, um, very receptive to what impacts their bottom line, to, to making money ultimately. Um, and in addition to the sting, sorry, the lawsuits associated with these stings, there were more than about 30 municipal lawsuits filed against the gun industry beginning in, um, 
1998, the lawsuits argued in part that gun makers and dealers could have done a better job of keeping guns from criminals. Some of the lawsuits were dismissed, others were allowed to proceed, but in uh, October of 2005, George W. Bush signed into law uh, a new federal law called the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act, the PLCAA. You, you know you have a lot of power in Congress when you don't even have to come up with a snappy acronym to get your law enacted. The, the, the PLCA was enacted in, um, in 2005, and then the PLCAA gave, gave the gun industry enormous protection from these kinds of lawsuits, whether they were in conjunction with these things or not. Um, they, uh, they gave them very broad immunity from liability, a kind of immunity that essentially no other um, product manufacturer in the United States enjoys. Uh, they didn't provide people who were harmed with any kind of alternative compensation scheme. They even said that the law would retroactively apply to, to pending lawsuits which had to be dismissed and in fact were. And as a result, the, the public health function of, of lawsuits, litigation in general, something that Steve Terrett has taught us about for many years, um, was, um, was eroded. Now, there were some relatively narrow exceptions to the, to the PLCAA, exceptions that allowed lawsuits to, to proceed nevertheless. And New York City took advantage of one of those exceptions. One of those exceptions is if, um, if the basis of the lawsuit is that the dealer was knowingly making an illegal sale. And so, uh, as Mayor Bloomberg uh, alluded to this morning in his opening presentation, uh, New York City used crime gun trace data to identify uh, a bunch of dealers that were disproportionately supplying the guns that ultimately got picked up from criminals in New York City. Um, they engaged in, um, in undercover investigations and stings of those, of those dealers. 27 of them were, were caught making illegal straw sales, and, um, and New York City brought lawsuits against them. 25 of them ultimately settled and agreed to, um, to dramatically change their sales practices. They, they agreed to be supervised by a court-appointed special master that would um, make sure that they had implemented these ways to make it harder for straw purchases and other kinds of illegal sales to, to occur. So, uh, so Daniel Webster and I and others have been uh, looking at the effects of those, um, of those agreements and the diversion to, to New York City criminals by, by the 10 dealers that, that we studied was, was dramatically reduced, 80% reduction. You just don't see that kind of enormous reduction in, um, in diversion for other kinds of gun violence prevention intervention. So again, targeting that small number of dealers that, um, that are disproportionately responsible for supplying guns to criminals ha has the potential for enormous enormous benefit. But this, this kind of information um, targeting those dealers relies upon access to the, to the crime gun trace data, the, the data that tells us which gun dealers are in fact um, are supplying guns um, to criminals. And so you've heard so far today about the, the TART amendment named for a congressman, Todd Tiart who added the language beginning in 2003 to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms appropriation language. The TR amendment has, um, has evolved some over time, but its major provisions today are that ATF can't require dealers to conduct a physical inventory of their, of their store as part of an inspection to make sure that that their stock lines up with their sales records, again, that they're not selling guns out the back door. Um, the gun trace data can't be supplied to the public directly or to researchers like Daniel and me and, and Anthony and Garen and others who use it. And the background check information uh, has to be destroyed within 24 hours. So, so a remarkable thing, Mayors Against Illegal Guns has been working hard to um, to address the, the TR amendment. We're hoping that we'll see some recommendations coming out of the, the Biden Commission with regard to 
to tea art, and we've done some research that, that looks at some of the effects of tea art. There was a, um, there was a Milwaukee area gun store called Badger Guns and Ammo, and a report came out in, um, in May of 1999 showing that Badger Guns and Ammo was the, was the number one, was number one in the nation in the sale of crime guns, not just in Wisconsin or Milwaukee, but number one in the nation. Um, in fact, supplied fully half of Milwaukee's crime guns. Um, so after that report came out, which frankly embarrassed Badger, as it should have, um, Badger announced that it would no longer sell these Saturday night special junk kind of guns that Daniel mentioned before. It, would, it wouldn't sell those kinds of um, small, poorly made handguns commonly used in, in crime. So that's, that's 1999, and then along comes the, the TR Amendment protections in 2003 to 2006. So this gave us a nice opportunity to see um, what happened first when Badger made its decision to, um, to stop selling these, um, these guns that are disproportionately favored by some criminals, and then what happened after the TR protections came in. So, all right, I'll, I'll follow Garen's lead as I do in all things and show you. Um, this, is, this line is when the, the Badger sales policy change occurred, and we're looking at the number of guns diverted to criminals within a year of retail sale. That's a, a measure of, of gun trafficking. And, you know, without even knowing the scale, you can, Badger is in the, the dark line here. You can see what happens after um, Badger's change in sales policy, again, embarrassed by the trace data, they, their um, number of guns that are diverted drops dramatically, dramatically compared to the pre-intervention the pre period. And then what happens after the Tiard Amendment comes in, the Tiard Amendment, again, protecting Badger from the public disclosure of some, some kinds of trace data like this? Again, the, the natural experiment, the sad, in fact, natural experiment shows um, that Badger now, no longer fearing this kind of public humiliation, uh, sees that um, the number of guns that they're supplying to, to criminals within a year dramatically goes back up. So, so sadly, a, um, uh, a natural experiment that doesn't have a happy ending, but we're hoping that, that data like this helps um, helps the, um, the Biden Commission and others to see exactly why the TR Amendment is so pernicious. So um, I'll see if I can get us two minutes closer to being back on time here. Um, what, is, what does all this mean? Well, firearm dealers are an important source of guns for criminals. Even if, even if most criminals aren't going directly to a gun dealer to, to buy the gun, Again, gun dealers are the, the first source of guns um, that, that get out into the world. And if, uh, and if it's a straw purchase that ultimately winds up in the hands of a criminal by focusing on the gun dealer, um, we can make a difference through dealer licensing, through enhanced oversight um, of dealers. We can address illegal trafficking. But there are legal obstacles that persist, obstacles like the Firearm Owners Protection Act, like the TR Amendment, and like the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. They're not insurmountable, but um, our ability to curtail the dangerous practices of some dealers would be dramatically easier without these um, kinds of federal legal obstacles. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Anthony Braga, who's with uh, Rutgers University and Harvard University. Uh, Anthony has been uh, an expert for decades now in law enforcement strategies to address gun violence, in, um, not only on, on the trafficking side, which he'll talk about today, but on um, discouraging criminal acquisition and use of guns as well. So, Anthony. Uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that I wrote this paper with my uh, good friend, Pete Gagliardi. He'll be making some comments after I finish. And essentially, I'll be making an argument to you uh, 
about steps that need to be taken in order to support an effective supply side enforcement strategy. The basic idea behind supply side enforcement is that you want to discourage or reduce criminal acquisition and use of firearms by increasing the price of acquiring a firearm. And that price could be uh, the prices they face on the street when they are purchasing firearms, or it could be what economists call the effective price of making a transaction, which is the amount of time and hassle that they face in trying to locate somebody who's willing to sell them a gun. If you can increase either, the idea would be that they would economize on the amount of time they're carrying guns, using guns, and this would reduce violence on the streets. And one of the basic perspectives of this approach, especially in the current uh, legislative climate, is that you're trying to reduce gun crime by keeping these guns from falling into the wrong hands, uh, that of the bad guys, those who are legally prescribed from having a gun, while at the same time not infringing on the rights of the good guys or those who are legally entitled to have firearms. Now, whenever you look at where do criminals get guns from, you see a, a large literature that suggests that many crime guns are stolen. And this is true. There, theft is a problem. And there are other things that we can do about theft, working with local police departments. Uh, but you do have an, a noteworthy portion of guns that are recovered in crime that have been recently diverted from legal firearms commerce that you can, I think, put strategic interventions uh, in place that can reduce those supply lines of guns uh, to criminals in a, in a pretty direct way. Uh, I'm going to review some of the evidence that suggests that uh, legal commerce is incredibly leaky and that gun traffickers exploit this system and represent important pathways through which criminals get guns. And then I'll summarize some of the research that, is, uh, that shows that gun markets interventions do in fact have some impacts. Uh, we don't know whether those impacts yet translate into violence reduction gains on the streets, but it's time that we started to develop that body of knowledge because there's a lot of evidence that suggests that it really could. And uh, then I'm going to frame six recommendations um, for supply side strategy for ATF in particular that could strengthen uh, the way that they go about investigating gun traffickers. And ATF is the primary law enforcement agency uh, that regulates and enforces our nation's federal firearms laws. And essentially, they're fighting this fight with one arm tied behind their back. And they need a lot more support in order to be as effective as they can be. Uh, now, I'm not going to go through all of the details. I'm just going to summarize the different studies that have been done, not only using ATF trace data and investigation data, but other creative studies that have been done by uh, people in the room. But it's important to recognize that ATF trace data in particular, investigation data as well, they do have their limits, for example, because of current restrictions. Uh, ATF trace data only gets you to that first retail sale. Uh, in most states, you're not going to know what happens after that first retail sale, and that's a blind spot in trying to figure out what's going on with illegal diversions of firearms, because ideally you want the, most, the time between the most recent transaction and its recovery in crime. Uh, there are other limits to the data. Uh, investigation data are limited by, it represents what ATF agents see when they do their jobs, what they investigate and what they report on, and, they, and what they end up recommending to U.S. attorneys to prosecute. Uh, so it's pretty much what they know, and you're missing what they might not know in terms of that data. Uh, but you know, despite the limits, you can use the data to good effect in trying to figure out what's going on, to understand gun market dynamics, and also to get a sense for whether interventions have worked. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences Firearms Panel looked at the data, and they said as long as you use it, with appropriate care, acknowledge its limits, and ideally use data that's been in, generated from jurisdictions that are comprehensively uh, tracing all of their firearms. So you have a reasonable sample of uh, guns that are recovered from, uh, from the streets in crime that you can use that data uh, to do some generalizations. Now, as both Jan and uh, Daniels have uh, uh, discussed, new guns are disproportionately recovered in crime. Uh, this is an important indicator that you do have a flow of guns that are going from legal commerce into the hands of criminals. And many of these guns, when you look at who the first purchaser was and who the ultimate possessor was, 
uh, you had a change of hands suggesting that not only is it moving quickly from the dealer onto the streets and into the recovery of, uh, uh, of law enforcement and crimes, but they're also changing hands very rapidly as well. Uh, beyond sales volume, as John was suggesting, some licensed dealers are disproportionately frequent sources of firearms, and I wholeheartedly agree with him that fundamentally this is good news. This is where we should be enforcing our, our uh, we should be focusing our enforcement and our regulatory resources on these identifiable risks to try and shut down those pipelines. Uh, work that Susan Sorensen has done and that Garen Wintermute and Catherine Vitties have done uh, surveying and interviewing uh, licensed dealers have shown that there are licensed dealers under test conditions who are willing to participate and make uh, illegal sales. Um, that's important information. On average, roughly about a third of all the crime guns recovered in a particular jurisdiction came from that community. The remainder have come from somewhere else in terms of the first purchases. And of course, that varies depending on the community that you're looking at. Somewhere like New York, it's a much smaller proportion that originated from that particular community. Somewhere like uh, Houston or New Orleans, much larger. And that's a factor of the looser gun control laws in those jurisdictions. It's well documented that crime guns tend to move from states with weaker gun control laws to states with tighter gun control laws. For example, my hometown of Boston, we have a, the Iron Pipeline, the I-95 states, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Georgia, Florida, Virginia that generate uh, a little bit more than a third of our guns. We have another third of our guns coming, well not quite a third, about 25% uh, of our guns coming from New Hampshire, uh, Maine, and Vermont uh, that are ending up in crimes in Boston, and only about a third of our guns originating from within Massachusetts. Uh, so guns tend to migrate from those weak control states into the tight control states. And as I started off, gun traffickers tend to exploit an incredibly leaky system of commerce. And ATF investigation data reveals that there are multiple pathways through which gun traffickers uh, divert guns to criminals. Uh, corrupt licensed dealers, straw purchasers, the most frequent uh, category of trafficking is straw purchasing. Uh, private dealers operating either through one ads, over internet sales, operating at gun shows. And you also have organized theft where sometimes uh, criminals burglarize and hit licensed dealers and take their inventory and then rapidly that inventory shows up uh, on streets and cities. Uh, and often it's not, the, the illegal gun trade is not like the illegal drug trade. One benefit is, is that you have paperwork on firearms so you can trace them and, and you can figure out where they're coming from. Another difference is that they're durable goods. So you don't have that rapid sale of guns on the streets that you have of drugs. So when you look at the modal gun trafficking investigation, you're not looking at something that looks like the Kali cartel. The average gun trafficking investigation, or at least the modal one, uh, involves very small numbers of firearms. At least 60% the last time ATF did a comprehensive survey of their gun trafficking investigations involved the illegal diversion of 20 or fewer firearms. There were some large-scale traffickers. The biggest were 10 and 11,000 but they were relatively rare. For those investigations that did involve a gun, dial uh, gun dealer, on average they diverted about 350 guns, so much larger numbers because of the obvious access. But what ATF typically sees are smaller number of guns that they know of that are uh, being recovered in crime. And that's what gun legal gun markets looks like, at least through a quick, I don't know, three minute survey of, uh, of the literature. Now, the other bit of, of important information is that uh, there is a developing body of knowledge that when you do intervene in gun, gun markets, the gun market dynamics do shift. And this is important information because a lot of folks think it's futile, that you can't do anything about these pathways through which criminals acquire guns. Uh, Jan and Daniel went through some of the research that they had done looking at undercover police stings and lawsuits in Detroit and Chicago and the important finding there was that the number of new guns that had changed hands, new guns being recovered in crime within one year, dropped dramatically uh, as a result of those interventions. 
and also in Milwaukee, Badger Guns, when it was shamed by being shown to be the number one uh, originator of crime gun traces in the country, they changed their practices and the number of new guns that had switched hands that were recovered in crime plummeted also. Some work that I did with the Boston Police Department, the Boston ATF Field Division and the U.S. Attorney's Office launching a gun trafficking enforcement action against recently acquired firearms, both uh, diverted within Massachusetts from Massachusetts dealers as, as well as out-of-state dealers showed that we had a 25% uh, reduction in the time to crime, the proportion of guns that were recovered that were new uh, with that strategy, the implementation of that strategy, and that was different than time to crime trends in other similar cities throughout the country. So you can make impacts on these pipelines of guns to criminals if you focus in on them. There have been other studies that suggest these, effect, these effects as well. Earlier, uh, Phil Cook, in his presentation on the Brady Act, talked about a study that I did with him looking at the sorts of states of firearms after the passage of the Brady Act. And what we found was that for those guns that were recovered in Chicago, after the Brady Act, you had a noteworthy shift in the source states of guns where they were first purchased after the Brady Act was implemented. Uh, the number one state was Mississippi. Once Brady was implemented and folks going to buy new guns uh, in Mississippi had to then, there pass a criminal background check and generate paperwork on the transaction, they then had to, uh, there was no competitive advantage of going to Mississippi any longer. So the number of guns that were being recovered from that street dwindled down from 20% to 3% uh, after the implementation of that law. So there's reason to believe that if you were able to launch an attack on illegal firearms markets, trying to identify gun traffickers and uh, apprehend and prosecute them, that it could shut down supply lines of guns to criminals. Uh, unfortunately, one of the many reasons why this idea hasn't been fully tested, but it would be limited given the current struggles that ATF faces. Uh, so Pete and I have made six policy recommendations uh, that we think could improve the situation if we were ever going to get serious about doing uh, a gun market disruption strategy and shutting down uh, illegal gun trafficking enterprises. The first has been mentioned many times today. It's requiring the execution of all private sales through federal firearms licensees. Uh, in most states, there are no background checks or transfer paperwork being generated on these secondary market sales. We clearly have a major loophole through which criminals can exploit acquiring guns through these unregulated secondary market sh sales. It needs to be shut down. Uh, another part of this reform uh, would be trying to improve the ridiculously cumbersome procedure that ATF uh, has to abide by in tracing firearms. For those of you who are not familiar with the procedure, when they recover a gun in crime, they get the serial number and the manufacturer, they call the manufacturer, figure out who that, was, that gun was sent to, they then, a distributor, they then call the distributor, there might be another wholesale in there that they have to call. Eventually they'll get the FFL, the licensed dealer, who uh, got the gun and sold it at retail. They'll call them and they'll say, okay, who did you sell the gun to? Uh, an incredibly inefficient system uh, that could be easily fixed without establishing a national registry of, of firearms and firearms owners, but just having them report serial numbers of transactions at the FFL uh, to ATF. And if you were able to do this electronically using a web-based portal, you could actually do some of the stuff that they show on CSI that you actually can't do in real life. <laughs> but clearly a very important reform. And other things that you might want to consider as part of this is expanding the multiple sales checks in ways that they've done along the southwest border state for certain types of auto-loading firearms. So we can also have multiple sales on uh, assault weapons and other concerning um, uh, firearms, long guns. The second policy recommendation that we're making is you really need to enact an effective firearms diversion or trafficking statute. The two most commonly used, even though there's roughly 40 
close to 40 different statutes available to ATF in making gun trafficking cases. The two most common statutes that are used are engaging in the business of selling firearms without a license or falsifying the ATF Form 4473. Both are very difficult to, to prove. For example, in the following the gun report, uh, you had in those investigations where ATF agents witnessed uh, and were investigating, engaging in dealing without a license violations, they were only able to charge it in 38% of the cases. In falsifying the 4473 form, they were only able to charge that in 41% of the cases uh, because they were very difficult to prove. In the instance of engaging the business of dealing without a firearms license, someone could just say, hey, I'm just you know, selling a few guns in the private market from my collection, um, passing them on, there's nothing illegal, I'm not making any sort of profit from this, I'm not engaged in the business in a way uh, that's consistent with, uh, with the law, so therefore I don't need a license. Anyone who's actually doing a straw purchase, which would be a violation of the falsifying the 4473, could easily say, hey, I had the gun, it's not quite what I wanted, didn't perform up to expectations, so I sold it to Daniel in the secondary market. There's no paperwork on it. I don't know if I know who this Daniel guy is, but you know, if I run into him, I'll let you know. Um, I mean, no exaggeration, very, very difficult to prove that someone actually falsified that form and was making a straw purchase for somebody else. So there needs to be an effort to develop a much more effective uh, federal statute that establishes a nexus to criminal activity and also starts thinking about what a threshold number of illegally diverted firearms would be. Uh, with that, you want to revisit sentencing guidelines uh, as well. Uh, I think it's important the, to recognize the harm that can be associated with the illegal diversion of firearms. Even one firearm can generate, as everyone in this room knows, a tremendous amount of harm. Uh, there's this legendary firearm that was recovered in crime in the city of Boston. The Boston Police Department uh, did the ballistic imaging, entered it into the Nibin system, and it came back to 14 other crimes in four cities, uh, in two states, in a one-year period. An incredible amount of harm from just one firearm. So straw purchasing and falsifying uh, uh, paperwork statutes should reflect the great potential for harm that these crimes have. And also, there are a lot of these, if you're investigating a, a corrupt licensed dealer, a lot of the record-keeping violations, you know, making false entries, failing to keep the required paperwork, they're actually misdemeanors. And that needs to be upgraded to reflect the actual harm associated with these crimes. It's incredibly important for jurisdictions to develop and implement regional crime gun processing protocols. I know Pete will talk about this a little bit more, but unfortunately, too many law enforcement agencies are not tracing all the firearms, they're not entering all the firearms into ballistics imaging, uh, they're not collecting DNA and trace evidence from these firearms, and there needs to be a system in place where you're comprehensively maximizing all the information that you're getting from a firearm, not only to hold criminals accountable, but also to determine where these crime guns are coming from. Incredibly important to be comprehensive in this. Very important is to create a strong and effective ATF. ATF is underfunded, it's without stable leadership, and it's often whipsawed by special interests. ATF definitely needs its, its budget expanded. It's been stagnant for the last 10 years, only increasing marginally, not even with the pace of inflation. Gun trafficking strategy really needs to be shielded from politics. And clearly they need stable, stable leadership. I would recommend going beyond making an out of session uh, appointment. It'd be nice if, if they did something like what the FBI did and have a director position that was appointed for a fixed 10 year term so it would be above the political fray. Also critically important uh, for jurisdictions to have access to crime gun information. You want to publish, as they did before, a national crime gun tracing report with city level analyses of crime. It was very important to have academic involvement in those, the production of those reports and some of the special analyses. And I can't say that enough. It's you know, the magic between having actual investigators with their detailed knowledge of how criminal enterprises operate, collaborating, collaborating with academics with their ability to bring an outside eye, analytic tools, 
and an unbiased perspective to what's going on, the knowledge that's created. So clearly reestablishing that and also some of the reforms to the Tia Hart Amendment, allowing CDC and NIH to fund gun research and maybe expanding NIJ's budget for gun research would be important as well. So if we're able to do some of these, it would be great to do all of these six policy recommendations. I think a lot of the obstacles necessary for effective investigation of firearms would be removed. We could think about launching a real attack on the workings of illegal gun markets. Obviously, appropriate investments need to be made, legislative changes need to be made, uh, and we need to improve our knowledge based on uh, the workings of markets and what might work and shutting those down. And I'm out of time. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to ask uh, Anthony's colleague, uh, Pete Gagliar Gagliardi, to, um, he's going to share some of his thoughts and experiences as, as a retired ATF person and also, um, you, you take that. thank you. Sure, now I'm Anthony's good friend. For two weeks he's been screaming at me over this. Uh, Daniel. Okay, so look. Be short and very short and sweet here. It's not a pun. <laughs> the fact is, investigators need data and information to identify offenders and apprehend them. When that information rises to the level of evidence, prosecutors need that information to prefer charges and to try the offenders. Every time an avenue is closed off to an investigator, a door is slammed here. We're no longer able to access that data. One arm gets tied behind our back. We have a database here that's supposed to be collecting vital information, and it's full of leaky, leaky holes. Another arm gets tied behind our back, and so on and so on until we're deprived of so much information, all we can do with our eyes is watch the chaos going on around us. So I think the common theme today has been this availability of good data to stop criminals before they have an opportunity to do more harm. So let me tell you a little true story that will sort of bring this all together. This is the way things should go every day. And I'm going to take you back to 1995 in Chicago. A black Nissan Pulsar pulls up to a street corner on South Blackstone Avenue. The driver sticks a Glock 9 millimeter out the window and fires into a group of men standing on the corner. A man named Keith Blumenberg, 19 years old, falls down dead. By the time the police get there, there's no one around but the body and some scattered 9 millimeter cartridges on the ground. Because of a good process in place, Chicago PD picks up the cartridge cases, and they go to the Illinois State Police Crime Lab, and they're entered into the NIBIN network that ATF provides its state and local partners. NIBIN stands for National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. The data is searched through the database, but there's no matches to the data found that day. Fast forward, eight years later, 2003, Chicago police officers are following a Lincoln Town car. The back window shot out. They thought that was suspicious. <laughs> they stop the car. One thing leads to another. There's a couple of gangbangers in the car. Lo and behold, a gun gets seized, a Glock 9 millimeter pistol. Because of the good process is still in place, that gun goes right to the Illinois State Police Crime Lab. It's test fired, and the test fire is searched through the NIBIN database, and this time, there's a hit, a match. Now police know that that gun that they seized 
from that Lincoln town car was the gun that was used to kill Blumenberg eight years before. The problem is that the people driving that car in possession of that gun eight years before were probably 10 or 11 years old. They couldn't reach the pedals of that Lincoln town, town car. And frankly, I have a problem reaching the pedals of a Lincoln town car myself. But what's happened here is police dependent on information and data available to them from the inside of the gun, the ballistics data, to determine what crime that gun was used to commit. But now they were stymied. So what do they do? They turn to the outside of the gun. On the outside of the gun, we have make, model, serial number, nomenclature, descriptors, that gun dealers are required to keep in their records that allows ATF and its state local partners to conduct a crime gun trace. And that's what they did. And they traced that weapon, that Glock 9 millimeter, to a woman named Chandra. During that investigation, they learned that Chandra had bought a couple of other guns that had turned up in crimes over the years. ATF and Chicago police officers uh, interviewed Chandra, and she said after a while that she bought the gun for her boyfriend, Samuel Coggs. She said Samuel Coggs was a convicted felon. He couldn't buy the guns himself, so she bought them for him. Police knew that Samuel Coggs was an enforcer for the Black Gangster Disciple Street Gang in Chicago. Frankly, Chandra was in a little trouble at this time, so she was becoming more and more cooperative, and she gave the ATF agents and the Chicago police detectives a key piece of information. She said that about eight years ago, two of her girlfriends came to her and said, we saw your car up on Blackstone Avenue in a shooting. But the next day, we received a telephone call from somebody. And they told us if we told anyone what we saw, we would be next. So for eight years, they kept their secret. But now, Chandra was in trouble. Sam Coggs, her boyfriend, was out and about somewhere. Chandra gave the name of her two girlfriends to the Chicago police. Chicago police and ATF detectives go and interview those two women, and they give the agents another piece of valuable information, the name of the person who was sitting in the passenger seat of the Nissan Pulsar who saw Sam Coggs stick the 9 millimeter out the window and kill Keith Blumenberg. It wasn't too much longer before they were what we call to flip that individual he testified in court, and Sam Coggs is where he belongs, serving the rest of his life in the Illinois correctional system. That's a good day. It doesn't always work that way. For example, we trace a gun today, just like the gun that was used to kill Keith Blumenberg. You know what? We stand a good chance of getting a report back that that gun was last sold 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 plus years ago. Good luck trying to find that original purchaser. We lose track of these things. We're denied information. Our information source ends. We're at a brick wall. Most likely, the gun has changed hands a number of times since then maybe even through legitimate transfers where there's records in some gun shop somewhere that could have given us another lead, but we've lost track. The chain was broken and we can't bridge the gap. Yet many times we do get lucky. Many times, especially in the case of short time to crime traces, we'll locate the purchaser. Then it's our job to go up and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm from ATF. I'm 
conducting this firearms trace. Did you purchase this firearm? Oh, yes, I think I did. What happened to it? I don't remember. These are all things that people have actually told me. And I have colleagues in the audience, I'm sure that they could verify this. I don't remember what I did with it. I don't have to tell you. I'm not responsible for keeping that information. The gun was stolen the same day I bought it, but I didn't bother calling the police. And this is my favorite. This is absolutely true. Some friends and I were on a raft. <laughs> this is true. Paddling toward an island on the Housatonic River in Connecticut. The raft capsized. The gun fell overboard and sank to the bottom. Yeah, well, it was an RPB industry semi-automatic SM-10, looked just like a Mac-10, and somebody had converted it to a machine gun, and that's what happened to that gun. And incidentally, that gun had been used in an organized crime murder just some months before. So ATF after agents and its state and local partners, you know, a strong ATF is something we need, but we also can't forget a strong state and local partner. Police budgets have been cut, and if one end of the system is tipped, it doesn't help anyone. We have to have it. This the whole law enforcement team's got to be strong. ATF find, agents find creative ways to work around this, trying to make their trafficking cases using a variety of both overt and covert methods. It takes time. It takes resources. In the end, a case may or may not be made. Sometimes, even when a case is made, the next job we have to do is get it prosecuted, and then we start up another hill. Getting it prosecuted depends on a number of variables. If the case does get prosecuted and the offender convicted, we start up another hill, and that is sentencing. An offender convicted for a crime like we've been talking about all day, falsifying a form, dealing without a license. I doubt that even today, when a person is charged with those types of crimes, that the tragic consequences we saw with Chandra's guns, if it were Chandra, Chandra being sentenced, the guidelines would not reflect those tragic consequences on what Chandra did with her guns and what they were used for. I would bet she'd get probation. Today, with tools like Nibin, the ballistics network I talked about, we can link crimes, guns, and suspects. We could also tell the court, for sentencing purposes, that this gun was used to kill those people. We can do that. With tools like E-Trace, ATF's electronic tracing system, we can follow a gun as it moves through the various sets of hands, sometimes following it right into the hands of the shooter. Like Sam Coggs in Chicago. In addition, when we look at gun trace information collected over a period of time, we can analyze that for strategic purposes, to look at patterns and trends. Once we could understand patterns and trends, that's when we really understand the gun market, the conditions, the situation in our region. To do all this, we have to balance three things. We have to balance people, processes, and technology, just like a three-legged stool. If one's too short, the stool falls over. If one's too long, the stool falls over. They must be in balance to hold the weight of what we're trying to accomplish. To do this, law enforcement needs continued support and resources in order to sustain the tracing of all crime guns and they're processing through NIBIN. Thank you.
Thank you, Pete. Um, I'm going to uh, take this time now to uh, open it up for some uh, questions or comments uh, for anyone on, on the panel uh, this afternoon so far. We have uh, folks again who are in the aisles with microphones. Um, first of all, thanks very much to the organizers and all the participants. It's been fabulous so far this morning. My question is, I wonder if anyone has ever looked at the financial effects of these various regulations on gun dealers, because that's a claim that I often hear. And I ask because, you know, as a public health professional, I couldn't care less if the gun dealers would make less money. But as a citizen who is interested in starting some local discussion in rural New Hampshire and letter to the editor campaigns, that kind of thing, I know that's something we're going to hear. And I, I don't know if that claim is true or not, but I feel we have to be ready to respond to that. Um, Garen, do you have an answer to that question? I have a partial answer, okay. but I'll follow you. No, no, you. OK. Um, in California, uh, we have an independent licensing system. We have um, not mandatory, but frequent inspections and various other things that retailers are um, required to do, including processing all those private party sales. Um, they're allowed to charge a fee for that, and the, the amount of that fee was negotiated and is seen as equitable. Um, as retailers have been asked specifically the question, so do you want to start processing all those private party sales? Um, they seem to be of two minds. There are those who grumble about the paperwork. Um, everybody assumes that they would be allowed to charge for their services, and that's only reasonable. Um, one thing that, that doesn't come up often is that, at least for this, there's uh, likely an offsetting benefit to, to retailers. And I'll paraphrase what one retailer said. You know, when, they, when they come in to do that paperwork, everybody needs ammo and accessories. A, a number of what were the things we're suggesting retailers have to take on also increase foot traffic into their places of business. And it gives them a chance to develop customers they may, might, not, might not otherwise have. I don't really have much to add to that. I don't know of any kind of systematic knowledge that, that is examined the qu so question that you given asked. Given that, let me, let me say one more thing. Sure. I, 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 we have some stuff that I can't talk about in detail um, because it's, it has not gone fully through peer review and been published yet. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a teaser. Um, so, so watch for some stuff over the coming year about what retailers think about all this stuff, and I think you'll be surprised, pleasantly so. Um, another question or comment? Summer. Hello. Um, as a constituent of Maryland, I'm pretty lucky that most of my representatives are um, in favor of the regulations that we've discussed today and the restrictions on purchasing guns that would minimize the gun violence. Um, however, the Congress members of other states are not necessarily on the same page. So what actions can be taken to help those with opposing viewpoints understand why it is vital to make these rules pass on a federal level? That's, that's a great question. Um, and, and certainly one that I think many people working on the political side of this uh, struggle with all the time. Uh, I'm going to pass this to my colleague, Jan Bernick, and let him have a try at this one. Sure. Well, you know, self-servingly, one of the things that, that we hope will help is some, a summit like this and the resulting book with the research evidence that the university has committed to placing on the desk of every member of Congress and of their staff. Um, but you also heard Mayor Bloomberg say this morning, you can't rely just on the fact that your elected representatives are in favor. You, you can't write to them and say, merely, I want you to vote for this, what you have to do is write to them and say, I want you to use your influence to persuade others um, to use your influence as chair of the Appropriations Committee or, um, or as uh, a senior member of the minority party in the House of Representatives. So it's, it's more than just a vote that we have to ask for of our elected officials. We have to ask leadership as well. Um, I, I'll just tag on to that. I mean, my, my own feeling is that um, to get some change along the lines I think you were suggesting, it's really going to require 
more gun owners to speak out in favor of common sense regulations. I think the politicians who feel like they have to work hard for their NRA A plus rating maybe would feel less like that's necessary if they had another group of gun owners who would sort of validate what their reasonable, uh, what they consider to be reasonable regulations on firearms. Because uh, as has been alluded to already, but we'll go into more detail tomorrow, uh, the vast majority of gun owners are supportive of most of the measures that we're talking about here. And I think that's the most critical thing is, is again, um, a politician being able to say that they are doing something that um, the gun owners agree with because they don't want to alienate gun owners who vote. Um, I, had a, I had a question. I just saw a documentary on Saturday called The House I Live In. It's about the war on drugs. And it talked about how there have been like 45 million arrests and a trillion dollars spent on that war. My question is what impact do you think the war on drugs has had on uh, gun violence? Because there's an allusion to the fact that a lot of accidents happened in the course of raids and uh, all that. But anyway, any thoughts on the, uh, the war on drugs and the gun violence issue? Uh, I'll just try to give a very uh, brief response to that. Uh, there have been some meta-analyses that looked at different uh, um, anti-gun trafficking type, types of interventions by law enforcement. Uh, to, they show that more often than not they lead to harmful impacts, meaning more violence. Uh, there are better ways to go about addressing a legal drug problem than the way we've uh, tackled it thus far. I think maybe the most important thing that connects to what we're talking about today with respect to guns and illegal gun markets is for people to really understand that even though some of the individuals might be the same individuals who are engaged in a, a illegal drug enterprise as well as the illegal gun side. Those markets are very different, as Anthony uh, indicated, and, and the data suggests that um, whereas the law enforcement interventions focus on illegal drugs have had counter, often counterproductive uh, outcomes, invariably the the efforts to disrupt illegal gun markets have had the opposite, that it's reduced the flow of guns to criminals. So um, they're, they're different markets. They, they, they're diff I, I don't want to go into a seminar on, on sort of microeconomics. So I'll stop there. But um, I don't think people who um, you know, are skeptical or, or um, you know, question uh, the, the war on drugs to think that, oh, well, that means we can't go again, uh, address the illegal gun market. I think they're different things, and, and you get different outcomes when you approach it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I add something? Yeah. I, I'd like to add something to your, your question. Um, when, when I started with the ATF, it was in the mid-'70s. And um, I, at the beginning, I, I worked a, a lot of undercover trying to determine where the crime guns were coming from. And at that time, I found that most of the crime guns that I was buying undercover were secondary market guns. They weren't new. They were, they were banging around for a while. Some of them were stolen because they had been reported stolen and other were, others could have been stolen, but uh, they might not have been reported correctly. So in any case, they were older guns, secondary market guns. Then all of a sudden, in the mid 80s, everything started to change. We started to see really for the first time groups of criminals buying new guns and smuggling them from uh, one state to another state that had less strict firearms laws. And um, as we tried to understand what that was, it really coincided with the, um, the drug cocaine wars down in Florida. And that sort of spread throughout the country. Started down there, but it spread and as these gangs started competing for territory, and there was lots of money to be made in the drug trade, um, they didn't need to get guns from the secondary market, uh, some, some gun that was stolen in a house burglary. They wanted the guns that they saw on TV, that the cops had, that the military had. So 
They had the money in their pocket to buy those guns. And that's where, where I personally saw the change. And that continues today because the drug market is still as robust uh, as it was then. D Dave, do you have anything that, uh, that I've got a colleague over there who's even more up to date on, on some of this? It's, um, let's have another question here. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Nancy Robinson. I'm from Boston. And I want to know, I'm picking up on something Professor Braga said about how new crimes are, uh, new uh, guns are disproportionately recovered in crime. Does anybody have a figure um, that would speak to uh, the profitability uh, for the gun industry um, of, of selling guns to the uh, illegal market? Um, I, I do not have that uh, readily available. Uh, when there were lawsuits against the gun industry, there was actually some, some effort to do precisely what you uh, suggest. Uh, so that information is findable. I frankly don't have it. Garen or Anthony, do you? Yep. So we'll make this collaborative problem solving. Um, there's the National Bureau of Economics Research working paper uh, that looked at the extent to which the industry over oversold guns into the southeast, knowing w one would connect the dots. The inference is that they knew that their oversales into the southeast were actually taking the iron pipeline to the northeast. I'm blocking on the names of the authors of that report. Anybody in the room? I don't think so. The, that, that kind of research, though, hasn't been done recently, in part because it was being done to support the litigation that municipalities were bringing. They were arguing that uh, the gun industry was overselling guns, profiting from their sales to criminals, and therefore ought to be responsible for the costs of crime that the cities were bearing. But with the enactment of the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act in 2005, those kinds of lawsuits have essentially dried up, and so has the demand for that kind of research. Hi, just, um, I was involved with some of the litigation against the gun manufacturers, um, and um, the research that we commissioned for that litigation showed that up to 22% of some, some manufacturers were relying on up to 22% of their output going eventually into the criminal market. Um, and, but um, yeah, that litigation, that research became impossible once the access to the data was stopped. Thank you, Rebecca. Daniel, just a quick question. Yeah. Do any of you know whether there's been any effort on a grand scale to mobilize through training or scripting frontline officers, deputies, and troopers to do more in this effort? So say a little more. Uh, so, so training frontline officers to, to get involved in addressing the illegal gun market? Is that what you're saying? Yes. When they Are they asking questions about guns, the right kinds of questions? When they take a gun into custody, are they asking the right questions or are they just passing it off for someone else to follow up on what's happening at the front line, Okay. Uh, particularly at the local level? Uh, I, I know that this happens in some places that really uh, make this a priority, and it really depends upon the local uh, police commissioner to, to what you know, degree he or she makes that a priority. Uh, Anthony and David have both have a lot of experience in this. Uh, David Chipman is a former uh, ATF official, joins a panel discussion now. Thank you, David. <laughs> and Anthony, either of you want to? I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question, Sheldon. Um, many organizations over time have really spent a lot of effort um, trying to train local police because, as we've heard today, ATF is a very small agency. In fact, ATF, there is many special agents at ATF as the Phoenix Police Department has sworn officers. ATF is smaller than the Broward County Sheriff's Department. So you can imagine that there's not much that ATF alone without local partners can do in this very complex effort you've seen today. Organizations like the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, during um, the time where we had Project Safe Neighborhoods, there was much training 
where officers were not only trained about how to trace a gun, encouraged to do so every time it's recovered, uh, but also learned some more uh, advanced techniques, encouraged to join task forces with ATF. Unfortunately, those efforts, because of budget cuts, have dwindled. Uh, there aren't as uh, many PSN trainings as there once was. We have not dedicated that effort. And this is problematic, because most police officers don't stay in the profession that long. They stay in for about five years, and then they go on to other efforts. So we have to constantly train officers in that, which you point out, which is a key joint effort. Yeah, and the uh, Boston Police Department, um, what, what they end up doing is they train all their officers when handling a crime scene to ensure that they look for all of the possible crime gun related evidence that firearms every single firearm that's recovered gets traced so they have that comprehensive information on inside and outside of the gun and when somebody is arrested in possession of a firearm they make sure they're debriefed on where they got the gun from so they can try and work some of those underground street markets and figure out how guns are moving about in the neighborhoods that's those set of policies are implemented on a police department by police department basis. It's nothing that's standardized across the country. And can I add, Daniel, it's that lack of standardization, especially regionally, uh, that we at uh, ATF and IACP is trying to encourage. Imagine if all departments within a region or state uh, looked at the recovery of a crime gun identically and all in unison, then other agencies could uh, benefit from the intelligence of their partner agencies next door. Well, it uh, President Ron Daniels, have a sure. I, I actually don't have a have a question for the panel. Um, you know, as I've been sitting through the last several hours, and particularly this last panel, um, and listening to the various recommendations that we have, and in many ways we hear echoes of what Mike Bloomberg said earlier today in terms of the kinds of regulatory interventions that would respond to the yawning gaps that we now have in the regulation of the industry, both on the supply and on the demand side. Um, and I guess my, my question is, you know, and perhaps this is an unduly quixotic question because it assumes that we would get some or if not all of the proposals that are uh, being discussed today adopted. Um, I'm interested in the panel's view of what the dynamic changes would be to the nature of the gun industry that would then create new regulatory challenges. So, um, for instance, we know, you know we've got 300 million handguns that are out there currently in the United States. And we know that there is some subset of consumers who are going to work feverishly to avoid the regulatory qualifications or adherence to them, both on the mm -hmm. supply side and the demand side. And we know we've got the internet we know we've got the prospect for offshore purchases and so forth, and we know that we have an even more robust secondary market than the one we have now. So what I'm worried about is that the industry we have today, the structure, the market that we have today, will change very radically were we to get this uh, first best world of regulation adopted. And then the question is, if you only have a moment to get the right regulatory structure, is what we're proposing comprehensive enough to deal with the e dynamic effects, with the changes in the industry that we're likely to see um, in light of this package that um, was proposed earlier today and has been, to varying degrees, uh, 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 reinforced uh, through our deliberations. Um, I, I'll start and then I'll hand it off to my other panelists. I think Garen wanted to, to weigh in. Uh, so just on the first part of your question, just to uh, boil it down, would there be some sort of modification by the industry that it would, in essence, negate what might happen due, due to regulations, if I understood what you were getting well, at? Just in, you know, imagining that this is dynamic. Sure. You know, right. Um, is good for the next decade, anticipating changes in the way in which both consumers and suppliers uh, uh, sure. in the industry, um, you know, how, how they will currently operate. How okay. they will operate. 
Well, this is going to be a difficult question to, to answer because we're not in that world yet, but we do have some evidence from at least what states do that get close to what, what the recommendations are. So um, while certainly one would anticipate some adaptations in that marketplace, um, whether you're talking about the more formal industry or, or the more underground market, um, again, this illegal market is not like the drug market. There is not, yes, people are making money in it, but they're not getting, for the most part, enormously rich. And if you place enough risk associated with engaging in that business, I think that you don't have to stop every such sale, but because our problem is so big, I do think that you, you could have an impact. I think many of the things that are being proposed uh, in terms of federal reforms, where we're talking about universal background checks, in terms of um, having better laws to, to go after straw purchasers and, and um, traffickers. Uh, uh, to me, the, the pattern of evidence from research that, that I reviewed earlier anyway and, and have conducted suggests to me that, uh, that it would be effective. I mean, um, we, the, the current, you know, state-by-state state kind of system gives us some impact, but you, you get so much more if you could actually institute that on a full federal level. Uh, so I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic that you could um, disrupt the illegal gun markets, make it harder for criminals to get guns. And, and I think that there's, uh, there, there's a wonderful study that was led by uh, Phil Cook that Anthony Braga is a co-author on that looked at the underground gun market in Chicago and found something very surprising, which was that it's not nearly as easy to get a gun in this underground market that, than we, many people believe. And that, uh, and that that is due in part to some of the law enforcement procedures that were just talked about. Chicago Police Department really has focused on guns for a very long time in a very aggressive way. And that seemed to play out in the study of that underground market. Um, so let, I'll let Garen finish up on that. Thanks a lot for, for bringing this up. Um, I, I've heard two things today that I think we've not done a very good job responding to, um, and you, you've mentioned them both. Um, we all trashed Brady for not going far enough. It left out the private sector market, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think we know if the things that we are proposing go far enough or not. And a continuing concern that I have, and I'll speak only for myself, uh, is, is this. Have, have we been self-trained for so long to think so little that now we're not thinking big enough? I, I am capable of thinking much bigger than this, and Steve and others have heard some truly radical proposals um, that I don't think we'll get there. Um, let me come back to the basics and a, a public health approach, uh, which insists, among other things, that much be done at the same time so that we don't squeeze a balloon in one place only to have it pop up in another. And I think an array of complementary actions are being proposed here that would make it fairly difficult even for a malevolent industry, which I do not think we have. I think we have an essentially a moral enterprise interested in maximizing profits and minimizing liability um, would make it difficult even for a malevolent industry to, um, to thrive in illegal commerce. I'll point to an, a couple of examples. Um, one is that uh, in the early 90s, the um, number one, number three, and number five maker of uh, semi-automatic pistols in the United States were all makers of Saturday night specials. They were all, um, all, all those companies were owned by members of the single extended family, or in one case, a friend. And they were all located in basically the same place in Southern California. And uh, the opportunity that that presented was taken advantage of. And that segment of the industry went out of business in Southern California, and nobody filled the gap. Um, there is basically a manufacturer a small network that operate under the same name headquartered in Ohio 
but, but nothing like there was before. I don't think that gap went unfilled because the industry woke up and said, ooh, this is bad, we're, gonna, we're not going to sell those guns. I think they were concerned about the liability. Um, but the other thing I'm gonna bring up, and this is, this is just really a long ball and then I'm gonna shut up. The headquarters of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, uh, which I have visited, um, is 3.2 miles. It's a seven minute drive from Sandy Hook. The morning after Sandy Hook, thinking about that, I went to their website. Their website used to have um, the, you know, the contact us, the roster of employees. They had the picture and a brief bio of everybody from the CEO to the guy in the mail room. I am not making that up. And that had been taken down. And I think, I suspect it was taken down because as their website actually said uh, that day, although you had to look for it, um, they were involved. This was their neighborhood elementary school. Their kids, their employees' kids, their acquaintances' kids were probably there that day and we just, nobody's connected the dots yet. But NSSF is the industry's um, intellectual hub and I refuse to have that labeled as an oxymoron. Um, every senior executive in the industry knows the people at NSSF. And that means that every senior executive in the industry is not all that many degrees of separation away from a kid who was at Sandy Hook that day. And this is all just me looking at geography and, and the structure of the industry. Nothing has been said. Um, but I suspect in ways that I certainly at least do not know, this may be yet again a unique event. Um, and I'm bringing this up at some detail now because I'm hoping there's somebody in the room who does have an in with the industry because I think there's an opportunity we might be able to say, this was in your yard. You, you need to help on this one. I'd like to add uh, to your question too, um, and this comes from my own personal research, 25 years investigating gun trafficking cases and the frustrations I saw under this current structure in trying to do that. If we had a format where there was a criminal background check required on any transaction, these photos of people lingering outside uh, gun shows, transferring guns, they'd have to evaporate because me as a law enforcement uh, agent would know immediately that a crime was afoot. The problem we have now is to perfect a, a dealing without a license case, you have to assemble your forces 10, 20 times, make buys over a period of time. So I can just tell you within that structure, to me there's a, a much better hope and chance to actually enforce the intention of this law. There are some unintended benefits, I believe, for a structure that requires guns to be sold by dealers. We would have a boon in small business. They would have to create more. Obviously, this would have to be countered by more regulators uh, with ATF inspectors that could go and make sure that uh, all the paperwork is being followed. Uh, but to me, we haven't yet even tried how to approach this in a reasonable fashion with a, you know, a, a background check required. And I think at that point, the learning begins. I, I think that's a great uh, point to, to end on. I, I want to thank my fellow panelists here and for your questions. We're going to take a 10-minute break, so if folks can be back at uh, 3.56, we'll resume.